Greetings and welcome to 303. We are in Senior English A, and we have our hymnals open to page 92 and following. Our project now is to introduce ourselves to arguably one of the most important writers of the English literary tradition, Geoffrey Chaucer. Now, we've given other lectures on Learn Strong that you can see here in regards to um, Geoffrey Chaucer. Now what we'll be doing is specifically following the work of our textbook particularly. I'm with you on page 92, 93, and following, and we are working at level one bullet point only. So as you get ready to take these notes, all you have to worry about now is just simply writing some pieces of information down that can help you with two things. One, obviously exam prep. Two, the reading of Canterbury Tales. We'll get to that in a moment. Let's talk Chaucer. Let's start with, first of all, dates. You see it at the top of page 92. Go ahead and write down Chaucer's name and please write down those dates. Notice the question mark after 1343. That's because the birth records are not so good for this time period. And notice the death date of 1400. So if you're looking for a round figure for Chaucer that you stick in your brain, one can be 1350, the other can just be 1400 is death date, all right? Let's go ahead now and read together some of the information about Chaucer. Son of a merchant, page in a royal house, soldier, diplomat, and royal clerk. Geoffrey Chaucer saw quite a bit of the medieval world. His varied experiences helped prepare him to write The Canterbury Tales. Let's go ahead and write down that title real quickly. The Canterbury Tales, T-A-L-E-S, will be Chaucer's most famous text that he will have written. This, notice your textbook calls it a masterpiece, provides the best co uh, contemporary picture we have of 14th century England. So let's write this down. If we want to know what people in England lived like during the 14th century, the place we will go is Canterbury Tales. Gathering characters from different walks of life, Chaucer takes the reader on a journey through medieval society. So let's jot this down really quickly already. We'll come back to say this several times. Canterbury Tales is going to be our best uh, referencing of 14th century medieval society. Let's review, though, a little about Chaucer and who he was. We'll begin with the poet's beginning. I'm on page 92. Again, all you're doing is reading with me. Again, our project here is to not to just to have the instructor here read to you and even for you, but rather aiding you as you read along, especially if you are trying to improve your reading. Follow along and see how well you are able to read and understand this material. The exact date of Geoffrey Chaucer's birth is unknown but official records furnish many details of his active life. Born into a middle-class family, Chaucer was sent in his early teens to work as page to the wife of Lionel of Antwerp, a son of the reigning monarch Edward III. Through this position, middle-class Chaucer was introduced to the aristocratic society of England. So let's just pause and make an observation. Born middle-class, raised around upper-class, aristocrat. So that allows him to be able to have a pretty good understanding of both the middle class as well as the upper class. And then because of the jobs that he'll have, he's going to know quite a bit of the lower class as well, which will allow for him in Canterbury Tales to be able to represent all three classes. This will be invaluable for us in our study of Canterbury Tales. In 1359, I'd write that date down, in 1359, while serving in the English army in France, Chaucer was captured and held prisoner so, whoa, he had the experience of actually being captured. King Edward paid a 16-pound ransom for his release, a sum that was eight times what a, single la a simple laborer might have made in a year. In 1366, Chaucer married Philippa Pan, a lady-in-waiting to the queen. Their eldest child, Thomas, continued his father's rise in the world, marrying a noblewoman, acquiring great wealth. So in other words, let's point out that Chaucer is going to have the experiences again of having both the exposure to middle class as well as to upper class. The poet matures is the next heading. Let's write it down and then make a couple of quick observations here. Again, I'm on page 92. Chaucer began writing in his 20s, 
practice, practicing his skills as a poet as he rose through the ranks of medieval society. His early poems were based on the works of European poets. These were followed by various translations of French poetry. His first major work, The Book of the Duchess, was probably completed in, uh, completed in 13, early 1369, almost one year after the death of Blanche of Lancaster, for whose grieving husband, John of Gaunt, he wrote the poem. As Chaucer grew older, he developed a mature style of his own and displayed a deep insight into human character. Let's just pause for two things. One, Chaucer learns to be a poet by translating other poets, especially the French writers, okay? Number two, he will develop his own mature style, and he is very interested in human characters. Human characters. Okay, I'm with you on page 93, The Canterbury Tales. Chaucer wrote The Canterbury Tales in his later years. One, no one knows for certain what prompted him to begin this work, although scholars have sometimes speculated that Boccaccio's Decameron, that classic story of stories, is going to be uh, maybe some of the impetus behind why Chaucer would want to create something similar, a collection of stories. We might call it an anthology of short stories, per se. Okay. Chaucer's inspiration may have come from his own per participation in the pilgrimage to Canterbury. A pilgrimage is a long journey to a shrine or holy site undertaken by people who wish to express their devotion. So let's go ahead and write this down really quickly. Canterbury Tales will, uh, will be built around the idea of a pilgrimage. A pilgrimage is a religious journey. Of course, the two most famous pilgrimage sites in Christianity are going to obviously be Rome, where the Holy See is of the Roman Catholic Church, and the great city, holy city of Jerusalem in Israel, right? Okay, so those are going to be the two famous places. Canterbury is a small town outside of London where we're going to be told lots and lots of English people go on pilgrimage, especially if they don't want to take the long journey to either Rome or Jerusalem. The Canterbury Cathedral was the focus of devotion because St. Thomas of Becket was murdered there in 1170. Let's write that down. In 1170, a very famous churchman named Thomas of Becket was murdered in that cathedral, and later he is going to be canonized and deemed a saint, and therefore his burial very famous there in that cathedral. Chaucer certainly had the opportunity to observe many pilgrims starting their journeys. A window of his London home overlooked the pilgrim road that led to Canterbury. In his masterwork, each character tells a tale or a story on the way to Canterbury. Just as the tellers of the Canterbury Tales come from the length and breadth of medieval society, the tales encompass medieval literature from romance to comedy, from rhyme to prose, from crude humor to religious mysteries. Only 24 of the projected 120 tales were finished, but they stand together as a complete work. Let's write that down. There were 120 planned stories for Chaucer. He only finished 24 of them before he tragically died. It, it of course, has always been speculated what kind of amazing stories would this guy have been able to create if only he could have remained alive a little longer. We actually call Chaucer the father of English poetry. And so we'll want to write that term down, and this is our last heading on page 93. In his own lifetime, Geoffrey Chaucer was considered the greatest English poet. Recognized as a shrewd storyteller, he was also praised by a contemporary as the first to, quote, rain the gold dewdrops of speech and eloquence, end quote, into English literature. Throughout history, new generations of poets writing in English have studied his work for both inspiration and insight. Chaucer lies buried in Westminster Abbey, the most famous church in England, arguably one of the most famous churches in the world, in recognition of his unique position in England's literary tradition, Westminster's honorary burial area for distinguished writers called Poets, corner was established around his tomb. So let's write this down. In Westminster Abbey, there is a corner there called Poet's Corner, where very famous people have been buried, and of course, all built around or constructed around the most famous poet of them all, Geoffrey Chaucer. The words in Middle English at the right here of your paper come from a famous Chaucer poem, 
They're not, uh, they are not on his tomb, but they serve to measure both his distance from us and his closeness to us. You can, for example, read some of the language of Chaucer there on page 93, and you can make out the words even though the orthography or the spelling is a little bit off. For example, you can see the word ye and knows that it means, know that it means you. You can see the word no, but notice on page 93, notice the spelling, K-N-O-W, E, notice the word speech and the spelling change, right? Notice that the word thousand is spelled the way we would spell it today, but the word words is a little bit different. Do you see it? So you have different kind of spelling. We'll point this out as we are working with the uh, orthography of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. We will be working in translation, as we'll talk about here in a moment. Let's go to page 94 really quickly. Chaucer's sharp eye for dress. Let's think about how clothing and dressing is a way to actually say something about who you are and what you are, right? Okay, for example, in today's world, we often will talk about two different types of jobs, don't we? We talk about blue-collar jobs and white-collar jobs. White-collar jobs, people who wear white shirts and therefore suits to work. Blue-collar jobs, those individuals who work predominantly with their hands. Now, this is, of course, an old 20th century rendering. We don't normally talk as much about this anymore today, but clothing does in some ways, as Polonius says in Shakespeare's Hamlet, proclaim the man. Let's take a look at this passage now on page 94. You've got some drawings at the bottom of 94 which kind of help you out. Do you dress to impress or for success? Medieval dress codes. In the 14th century, rules dictating style depended on whether you were rich, middle class, or poor. No one below the rank of knight, for example, could wear fur. Merchants could wear the same clothes as knights only if they were five times wealthier, and women were forbidden from wearing silk head coverings. In the prologue to the Canterbury Tales, Chaucer relies on the details of the pilgrim's clothing and a general knowledge of the do's and don'ts of fashion laws to reveal their personalities, positions on the social ladder, and attempts at modesty or deception. So let's make a quick note. There are rules about what you can and cannot wear, right? And Chaucer will play the game sometimes of playing along or breaking those rules. The next heading, modest dress. The knight's coarse tunic, quote, stained and dark, end quote, could have fooled fashion watchers into believing he was without rank. Yet knights were members of the nobility and were allowed to adorn themselves with fur and gold. Pleasure loving, notice the next heading. A Franklin, a member in good standing of the top tier of 14th century hierarchy, was a pleasure loving fellow. This landowner carried, quote, a little purse of silk, end quote, that Chaucer aptly describes as, quote, white as morning milk, end quote. The wife of Bath's, quote, flowing mantle, end quote, hid her, quote, large hips, end quote. Her handkerchiefs were finely woven. Her stockings, quote, were of the finest scarlet red, end quote. And her shoes, quote, soft and new, end quote. Her clothing revealed her as a member of the middle class. Clothing that suits the profession, finally. A doctor in the group was adorned alarmingly in quote, blood red garments lined with taffeta, end quote, almost as if he were advertising his profession. Yet Chaucer wrote that the doctor watched every cent and was, quote, rather close to his expenses, end quote. Bottom line, no matter what you wear or when you live, your clothes say a lot about who you are, where you fit, and what you aspire to be. And notice you have some drawings then of some of the characters who will tell stories in Canterbury Tales and the way that they are dressed. Let's now turn to page 95 and are preparing to read the Canterbury Tales. Notice we will begin with the connecting to the essential question. In the prologue to the Canterbury Tales, Chaucer describes different medieval social types, briefly describes some social types at your school. In describing social types, you probably describe their clothes. As you read, note what Chaucer's description of clothes reveal about his characters. Let's write that down as you read. Note what Chaucer's description of clothes reveal about his characters. The essential question is, how does literature shape or reflect society? Now, as we turn to the literary analysis at 2B, as we get ready to study the uh, general prologue, we want to pay attention to these forms of characterization. 
okay? Techniques for revealing character. So let's write that down really quickly. Forms of characterization. By characterization, we mean, again, techniques of revealing character. So we can find out something about these characters. We will concentrate on two different forms of characterization. The direct characterization form presents direct statements about a character, like Chaucer's statement that the knight, quote, followed chivalry, end quote. Indirect characterization uses actions, thoughts, dialogue, and description to reveal a character's personality. For example, by saying the knight is, quote, not gaily dressed, end quote, Chaucer suggests he is not vain. Each character in the section represents a different segment of society in Chaucer's time. So you want to write this down. As you get ready to read with me the general prologue, you want to pay attention to their garment selections, their clothing, because that will tell us something about what part of society they're in. We roughly will have then, generally speaking, those three parts of society represented. The upper class, the middle class, the lower class. Another way to think about this, this, this declension is to ask about the religious group versus the non-religious people in the group. Okay? Each character in the selection represents a different segment of society in Chaucer's time. By using characterization to reveal the virtues and faults of each, Chaucer provides, we want to write this term down, social commentary. What in another lecture later I'm going to argue is called Chaucer's agenda, his political agenda. Writing that offers insight into society, its values, its customs. As you read, determine what Chaucer's character suggests about his views of English society and of life. Okay? The reading strategy here is a good one, and I recommend that you take a look at it when uh, reading complex texts. When you do not understand a long, involved sentence you are reading, repair your comprehension by questioning. For example, you may have trouble understanding the 18-line sentence at the start of Chaucer's prologue. To analyze the sentence, ask these questions. When, who, where, what, why, and how to identify essential information. And then you can obviously create a chart like the one right there to the right on page 95. I do highly recommend that you employ this system of reading, especially early on in the prologue as you are working through it with me. Finally, you know that these vocab words at the bottom of 95 are going to end up on your examination. You want to make sure you get them in your notes right now. And you want to be looking for these words when they arrive in our reading and our study of the general prologue. And then two of the stories of Chaucer that we will study, The Partner's Tale and The Wife of Bath's Tale. Thank you, and we'll see you in a few moments to study the, the general prologue.